You deserve it. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Um, we'll move to question time, and I'll call Senator Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, President. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Mm -hmm. During the 2022 election campaign, Mr Albanese said, and I quote, We've said we have no intention of making any super changes. Given Labor's track record of proposing higher taxes on retirees at the previous two elections, it is inconceivable that Labor wasn't planning its doubling of the super tax or something very similar when Mr Albanese made this promise at the last election. Why, Minister, is it that Mr Albanese deceived the Australian people before asking them to vote for him? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, Order. Thank you, thank you, uh, President, and thanks to the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate for the question. And it gives me the opportunity to remind uh, him and those opposite and all that, in fact, the uh, t changing of these tax arrangements for a very, very small proportion of Australians will not take effect until 2025. 2025, after the next election, the next election. Uh, and it may be that those opposite like to like to forget about this and like to focus on, as always, their pathology of conflict. But the reality is. Uh, what we have inherited is a trillion dollars worth of debt. We have inherited a budget in a position uh, that is unsustainable, and we are making sensible decisions about how to deal with that. And they include they include they include uh, changing uh, the concessional tax treatment of super balances over three million dollars. And it is important, despite the rhetoric again of those opposite and, and uh, their, their talk about doubling, to remind us all, uh, those of us in this chamber who are on above average incomes, uh, that there is still tax concessionality associated with these balances above $3 million, earnings on these, but, but, but still tax concessionality, which is effectively funded Order. by the sorts of workers. Order. The sorts of workers Senator on the Cash. sorts of incomes that Senator Walsh was describing just before question time. And I, for one, don't believe that cleaners and people on the factory line should be, should be subsidising tax concessionality Order. for people with superannuation balances of $3 million. It is a very small proportion of people. It affects fewer than the superannuation changes, fewer than your superannuation, cha superannuation changes Order. that you made, possibly when you were finance minister. I can't recall, uh, and I know that the, that those uh, opposite want to run a scare your campaign. Time has expired. Just a moment, Senator Birmingham. I called order at least four times there, and Senator Cash and Senator McGrath, you continued to interject. I would ask you to listen quietly, Senator Birmingham. First supplementary. Mr. Pre Thanks, President. Supplementary question. The minister just made a passionate defence of her beliefs that people shouldn't be receiving this concessional treatment. Given such strongly held beliefs, Minister, why is it that you and your government and your Prime Minister weren't honest with the Australian people before the last election? Our minister. I Thank you. I again make the point that this is a change that affects 0.5 per cent of people, uh, and it will not take place. Will not take place until after the next election, 2025. Order. Now, I would also make the point uh, that those opposite, uh, uh, and I'll take the interjections. Uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Order. Minister, please continue. <clears throat> Always happy for Senator Gallagher to take questions. He answers them brilliantly. Exactly. Answers them brilliantly, as she demonstrated Ask yesterday. I just would also make the point. Uh, I would make this point. Uh, those opposite have really demonstrated to Australians whose side they're on. That's right. Yeah, they're not on the side. They're not on the side uh, of people uh, doing it tough. They're not on the side. They're not on the side of per people on minimum wages. They're not on the side of households uh, whose electricity prices uh, are finding it hard to make electricity prices, uh, voting against the packages they wanted. They're not on the side of people who need skills. They're not on the uh, side of manufacturing you, Minister, jobs. Your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. 
Thanks, President. The government, including Senator Wong, keep referring to their alleged small number of Australians impacted. Indeed, Senator Wong on social media yesterday was posting about 99.5 per cent of Aussies not facing any changes. Yet Senator Gallagher yesterday made clear in this chamber that 10 per cent, one in ten Australians, would actually be impacted. When was the government advised of this? Will they set the record straight? And will Minister Wong delete her social media post? Order. Order. Minister, Minister, Wong, please, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Minister, Minister, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. I'm not going to call the minister until we have silence on both sides. Minister. Uh, does anybody know how many people in 30 years will be affected by the concessional contribution threshold change to superannuation that they made? 30 per cent of income earners. 30 per cent. 30 per cent. That's one in three of income earners will be affected by the changes you made on super. So let's be clear about the long-term effect of non-index changes. Uh, Senator Gallagher was up front yesterday about ours. I don't remember you ever saying that. Oh, by Senator the way, Cash. one in three Australians will be affected by Mr Morrison's changes. The Australian people are on to you. They are on to you and they know what you are about. And you are Minister not about Wong. average income earners. Minister you are Wong. not about families Senator who are Wong. struggling to pay ends meet. Senator you are Wong. all about yourselves and you are all about conflict. Order. Really, Senator Hume, when I've just brought the chamber to. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Henderson. <laughs> There's so much noise, it's hard to not be confused. Order. Thank you, Senator Watt. Sen uh, Senator Wong has still 12 seconds on the clock. I finally found some, some people that the uh, Leader of the Opposition will fight for. Not women fleeing violence, not an Australian manufacturing, not businesses looking for energy security, not cheaper childcare, not Thank cheaper you, medicine, Minister. not those Thank looking you, for Senator energy Wong. bill relief, but those with three— Senator Wong, resume your seat. Order. Uh, order. Inter Senator Watt. And on the left. Order! Order! Senator Cash! Senators on my left. Order! Senator Hume and Senator Rustin. Order! Order! Senator... I don't have any senators. Senator Rustin. I have no senators on their feet on a point of order. I simply have rude, disrespectful interjections across the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Senator Wong. Are we withdrawn? No, no, let me go. Okay. Uh, Senator Rustin, I, I withdraw. Senator Rustin, I withdraw. And by way down. of explanation, I make clear I was referencing the housing fund that you opposed, which Senator will be accommodation, Senator including Wong. for women fleeing violence. So you wear it. Order. Senator Rustin, I asked you three times to sit down, and I'm going to ask that you sit down. Order. Senator McGrath and Senator Watt. <coughs> Senator Rustin, no, I am going to have the call. I have no idea what happened because there was so much interjection in this chamber, except I had a bunch of unruly senators on my left and a bunch of unruly senators on my right. So I really have no idea. If someone has said something objectionable, you stand to make a point of order. You don't scream out about seven of you from your seats. It is disorderly and it's clearly disrespectful and it's taken me a long time to get control of the Senate. This is not appropriate. Senator Rustin. Uh, um, 
Thank you, President. I was wondering if I could seek your indulgence to perhaps have a look at the transcript, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, Senator Wong might then like to reflect on the fact whether she wishes to unconditionally withdraw her statement. Thank you, Senator Rust and Senator Wong. I withdraw. Thank you. Right. I have Senator White. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. What is the Albanese government doing to revitalise Australian manufacturing and address key national challenges? Uh, thank you, Senator White. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator White for a question about jobs uh, and about manufacturing. And of course, we, uh, we on this side understand that one of the major pressures on our economy is disrupted supply chains. As the Reserve Bank has said, supply chain issues are responsible for up to two-thirds of inflationary pressures in the economy. So to relieve this pressure, we need to be a country that can make things here. Need to be a country that can make things here and stand on our own two feet. And that is what the National Reconstruction Fund is about. It is a fund that rep represents one of the biggest ever investments in Australian manufacturing capacity, revitalising Australian manufacturing, creating secure Australian jobs, making things here, investing in new e industries like critical industries uh, and in seizing the opportunities for renewable energy. The Na National Reconstruction Fund is good for jobs, good for manufacturing and good for the economy. So I suppose it makes sense that that's why those opposite would oppose it. That's right. Because this is, these are the parties that neglected our supply chains and failed Australian workers, but they are very good at saying no. Just like they said no last year to providing families and businesses with relief from energy prices. They're more interested in the same old negative politics that you don't like the truth, do you? You don't like it. It's really amazing, isn't it? They vote against stuff in here and they don't like to be politically accountable for the things they vote against. I have never seen I have never seen an opposition actually vote against vote against price relief. Who would who would have thought? Who would have thought? Always negative, always on the attack, even if Australia loses. They said no to the Housing Australia Future Fund. And I know those opposite don't like it, but that is additional housing for women and children, including those escaping domestic violence. You are accountable for that decision. You may say no to making super stronger for the future you, and no Senator to ending time has the expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, why is the National Reconstruction Fund important to all Australians? Thank you, Senator White. Minister. <laughs> Oh, I'll take the interjection from the expert on the other side, Senator Scar, who says who talks about debt. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. He thinks there's more debt. He, he doesn't want debt associated with a fund that's about investment, but he's happy with debt that's associated with a tax break for that's people exactly with right. three million dollars in so right, Well, we'll there you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for Scar being very I'm clear not. about your political priorities. Very clear. Uh, very clear about Star your political pri pri priorities. I mean, he's entitled to those views. I don't think they're the views that most Australians share. But I return to the question. Thanks to a decade of neglect and failed policies from the Liberals and Nationals, we do not have the manufacturing capacity to do what we need to do, and we saw that during the COVID pandemic. We couldn't make enough PPE to protect ourselves. Our fund is about building a more resilient, more diversified co economy with more jobs in regional Australia, so we don't have to rely so much on other countries for some of our critical supplies and, so is, and to ensure we have the jobs you, and Minister, skills we need for the future. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, what are the obstacles to revitalising manufacturing and addressing these key challenges? Minister. Well, of course, the biggest, yeah, uh, uh, the biggest obstacle, of course, is those opposite. Exactly. The biggest, yeah. opposite, uh, biggest obstacles are those opposite. Uh, and one, 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 one wonders why they'd be so opposed to revitalising Australian manufacturing. Why be, they'd be so opposed to securing our economy. I mean, why don't they support Australian manufacturing? Why is it? Why don't they support economic sovereignty? Why don't they support Australian jobs? You know, I mean, they, we, we, we see a, co a coalition that simply wants to say no. We have a plan to address the key challenges facing the Australians and the Australian economy. Relief, repair, restraint, investment in Australian capacity, investment in Australian jobs. Those opposite 
have no plan. They left us with a trillion dollars in debt, a massive skills shortage, a hollowed out manufacturing centre sector, and now they're standing in the way of the solutions to the very problems they created. The very problems they created. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday, Senator Gallagher, you said to the Chamber that the purpose of the government's new doubling of super taxes was to make the super system sustainable. But the Retirement Income Review, in, published in 2020, said that the evidence indicates that the Australian retirement income system is effective, sound and broadly sustainable. Isn't Labor's doubling of the super tax simply another tax grab to prop up Labor's rampant spending, one that the now Treasurer explicitly promised not to do prior to the election because he knew Australians would never support it? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Well, the answer to that is no, um, but I welcome the opportunity again to, to uh, remind those opposite about the um, mess we inherited from them yep. and the yep. seriousness that we are paying for the first time in a number of years around budget repair. We have a trillion dollars of Liberal Senator Party Rath debt that we are managing, that we have to manage. We White. have pressures coming towards the budget that are increasing, not decreasing, and we can go through it again. Aged care. Medicare, hospitals, defence, all areas where pressure is increasing, not decreasing. We have a $50 billion structural deficit that we have inherited from you. That is what we are needing to repair, and that is what this very modest change to this concessionality of, of tax for high balance accounts over $3 million. It's a sensible change. It assists with budget repair. It means that we can make room for some of those pressures that you ignored but that Australians value. Things like paying for aged care workers. How about that? Making investments in those types of areas against a background of a bud budget that was riddled with waste and pork barrelling and failure to deal with the pressures and this view remember the back in black mugs we all remember them that budget was never going back into balance because we had a range of pressures heading their way but we also had this very nifty way of budgeting which is to budget for one year or two years for programs that are ongoing i mean the dishonesty in your budget when you were in government is galling, and we are fixing it. We take our responsibility seriously, you, and we will get on with it. Time for answering has expired. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Retirement Income Review also stated that the home is the most important component of voluntary savings and is an important factor influencing retirement outcomes. Given this important part of the retirement income system, will you rule out? Any changes to, including repealing, the First Home Super Saver Scheme, which helps first home buyers enter the property market? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much. Well, we've made clear what our position is on this uh, announcement uh, that we made last week. The Prime Minister has Senator made it Hume. clear on other aspects that have been raised in the last week. We have been very clear. It is a very modest, it is a very small change. It affects a very small number of fortunate people who have managed to save more than $3 million in their super. Good on them. Good luck to them. Their concessionality will be slightly uh, re Minister, reduced compared to what uh, Senator Hume. But, uh, Madam President, the question was about the First Home Super Saver Scheme and whether the government would repeal it or abolish it. Uh, Senator Wong. The question also started with the uh, reference to the family home, hence uh, sent the, senators, the minister's answers entirely re relevant. Thank you, Senator Wong. It uh, did have uh, a couple of senators' sentences before then, Senator Hume, and I think the minister's being relevant, but I'll continue to listen. And if uh, the minister isn't being relevant, I'll remind her of the question, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I did answer the question in, in my first um, remarks. Yes, I did. I said we have announced the changes that the government has agreed upon. We have announced them. You have the detail. You're opposed to it. We hear that. We know that you're going. We know that you are going uh, to die in a ditch for people with balances over three million, regardless of what's happening in other parts of the economy. 
I have answered the question. We have been clear with what our position is. The change was announced last Thank you, week. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hume, second supplementary. Minister, as you referenced yesterday, Treasury modelling predicts that without indexation, 10 per cent of Australians will be impacted by your new tax in the next 30 years. Will you table this modelling? Minister Gallagher. Uh, Thank you. That is information, that, is information that I had around the indexation. I'll, cha I'll check if there's further information I can provide, but I would say in 2016, the changes you brought in affected 4 per cent of people. In 30 years, they will affect 30 per cent. That's what happens—30 per cent. 30 per cent. 30 per cent, Senator Hume. This is a very modest change. It allows for some budget repair to occur because of the budget that we have inherited. We have spent the last nine months going through the rorts, the waste, the unfunded promises, the legacy uh, funding cliffs, the zombie Senator measures, McGrath. billions and billions of dollars buried in that budget that you were not upfront about. We have gone through them. We are making sensible changes to assist with budget repair. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last month the RBA said that as much of, as three quarters of the increase in inflation is a result of supply shocks, including corporate profiteering, that their models are not well suited to supply shocks and that there is very little that monetary policy can do to offset supply shocks. So here we find ourselves today with an RBA responding to a problem it doesn't understand with a solution that doesn't suit. Minister, do you believe that the RBA smashing renters and mortgage holders with interest rate increases in response to inflation driven by supply side shocks and corporate profiteering is the best economic policy that this country can muster? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I thank uh, Senator McKim for the question and for his ongoing interest in the performance of the uh, Reserve Bank. I think the bank has a very difficult job to do, and I think the government uh, has a job uh, to work hand in hand with monetary policy. Um, I, I await the decision of, of the bank uh, today, but I think the bank has explained it's a, it's a narrow path that they are following. Um, they have a difficult job to do. They are independent of government. I would say we have our review of the RBA. It's not linked, obviously, to the tightening cycle. We had, we had announced that review. Well, it's looking at the issue, um, Senator Dunian can chuckle, but it's looking at the broader issue that's raised about um, how fit for purpose the bank is and the fact that it hasn't been reviewed for a period of time. Uh, for, for some 30 years, I think. And so uh, this review, I think, is timely in the sense that we will get you know, some, um, the, the three panellists' uh, view on uh, whether there needs to be changes to any settings, um, the mandate, etc. The government uh, was aware of that. Obviously, it was an election commitment before uh, the last campaign. So I think that review in itself will, be, will allow us the best information available to check to see um, you know, how, or how to make sure that the RBA uh, remains fit for purpose for the job that it's got to do. But having said that, I'm not linking that in any way to the tightening cycle. We do have an inflation problem in this country. The, man the bank has a very clear mandate to um, ensure that inflation sits between the 2 to 3 per cent band uh, and ensure full employment. So they are following their mandate and they make their decisions independent of government. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, real wages declined at the fastest rate on record in December. The Treasury Secretary said at Senate estimates that the risk of a wage price spiral remains low. Does your government believe that nine going on ten consecutive interest rate increases to avoid a non-existent wage price spiral is to the greatest advantage of the people of Australia. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't think the um, the tightening cycle is being um, is being pursued in response to 
concerns about wages. I mean, the RBA, the RBA has been, you know, the bank was being clear when those opposite were in government and it was sitting at about 2% and not growing that he, the bank was concerned at that point about wages. Um, I think the comments they've made since when wages have started to lift is that they would keep an eye on wages. That's the, the general comments from the bank. Um, but again, I think in terms of the job that they have to do, the, the risk of persistent high inflation is devastating. And it's devastating on people on lower incomes who will feel that the, the hit from inflation harder than those, I would argue, who are on higher incomes. And so, you know, let's not pretend there isn't an issue here with inflation in this country. There is. And we have to manage it and we have to make Thank sure. Thank you, Minister. The time has Sorry. expired. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, banks, supermarkets and fossil fuel corporations are all booking mega profits. You said that the government needs to work with the RBA. So will your government introduce a corporate super profits tax to drive down inflation and fund cost of living relief for Australians who are being smashed by inflation, interest rate increases and the cost of living crisis? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Well, that isn't the government's policy to introduce a tax, um, as Senator McKim suggests, although I give him um, credit for persistence in asking me that question, but my answer remains the same. However, the point you raise on cost of living is real. I think the challenge uh, for those of us looking at, at the right way to respond and how we do need to work hand in hand with the, the bank or the, on the monetary policy side is the what meaningful difference can we make in a cost of living sense that doesn't have an inflationary impact. Um, and they are the issues, they are the decisions we've taken around our investment in skills. Uh, the National Reconstruction Fund, making investments in housing, our cheaper childcare, our cheaper medicines. All of those are sensible investments which do come with spending attached, but sensible investments which don't put um, upward pressure on inflation but assist people with cost of living. And that's the energy cost relief is another area and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Can the minister please update the Senate about what the government is doing to support the Australian manufacturing, including through the National Reconstruction Fund? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. And can I thank uh, Senator uh, <coughs> Polly for that very insightful uh, question and, of course, acknowledge her very long-standing support for Australian manufacturing, particularly in her uh, home state of Tasmania. As we all unfortunately discovered during the pandemic, the goods that Australians assumed uh, would be there when we needed them were not available. Across a range of products, our supermarkets and pharmacies couldn't get what we needed. Who can forget going to supermarkets with the long lines of empty shelves and the sense of disappointment that we all felt when we couldn't get the products we needed? That was uh, when the seed of the National Reconstruction Fund was planted. After a decade of neglect under the Liberals and the Nationals, it was time to reinvest in our manufacturing capability. Now that the government is seeking to make the NRF, the National Reconstruction Fund, a reality, it, it's once again uh, the Liberals and the Nationals that are standing in the way. The government plans are to grow from our strengths, places where we already have natural resources or the human capital compete to compete with the best in the world. The, uh, the National Reconstruction Fund will attract investment. It will help grow the Australian economy. Uh, but uh, most importantly, uh, Madam uh, uh, President, it will deliver high quality high-paying jobs for Australian uh, workers. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly, first supplementary. President, my minister, uh, minister, as you know, manufacturing is a vital employer in many regions around the great state of Tasmania. What role will the National Reconstruction Fund have in revitalising regional manufacturing after the decade of Liberal neglect? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Senator Polly. Well, <coughs> I'd have to disagree with you there slightly, Senator Polly, because it wasn't just liberal uh, neglect. It was liberal and national, ne liberal and national, liberal and national party, liberal and national party neglect uh, that has brought us to the situation uh, where we need a national uh, reconstruction fund. And uh, <coughs> sadly, it was the former liberal national government that did neglect manufacturing right across Australia. I've seen it, I've seen it firsthand with Holden's uh, yeah. and uh, unforgivable decision to kick that company out of this country. And this is despite the fact uh, that one third of manufacturing jobs are in regional and remote Australia. Manufacturers are based across regional Australia because of the access to natural resources, from minerals to agriculture to forestry and to much more. The NRF determined to continue Thank that focus Minister, on our regions. Expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. Yes, my question, uh, Minister, is what threats are there to the government's plans to deliver more skills, more high wages in manufacturing jobs and higher skills in regional Australia? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator Polly for <coughs> another very good question. Well, there they are, right across there. They're the obstacles to the creation of a national reconstruction fund. There are the threats for those opposite to improving our national self-sufficiency, investing in Australian ideas and turning them into great Australian businesses. Those opposite threaten plans to attract international investment and to deliver jobs, many of which will be right in your regional areas. The biggest threat to our plan for a national reconstruction fund is those senators sitting across the chamber. The coalition, the coalition, they say no investment, they say no opportunity, and they say no self-sufficiency. The Liberals, the Liberals and the Nationals say no, no, no to Australian jobs and Australian manufacturing. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator David Pocock. Order on my left. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Farrell. Uh, the Productivity Commission's latest report on government services showed that over a third of people seeking homelessness accommodation last financial year couldn't find any. One in three people looking for somewhere to sleep can't find somewhere to sleep. Does the government acknowledge the growing demand on homelessness services, and do you have any plans to increase their funding? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Pocock for uh, uh, that uh, excellent uh, question, and I, I appreciate very much that he has a, um, a deep interest in, uh, in this issue and uh, a deep concern uh, about the issues of uh, homelessness uh, in this uh, country, and can I say the <coughs> government uh, generally um, um, uh, shares, uh, shares your concern, but in particular uh, the minister who has responsibility for this, Minister Collins, is very focused um, on dealing uh, with this issue. And um, I mean, they're all extremely um, serious issues, but. Um, regrettably, at the last uh, census, um, there were over 116,000 people uh, experiencing uh, homelessness uh, in this uh, country, uh, and of course that is a an issue that uh, uh, we must uh, we must address. <coughs> it's unacceptable uh, that so many Australians are now forced to uh, couch uh, surf, uh, sleep rough or live in temporary or overcrowded uh, housing arrangements. Um, now, I understand, um, Senator Pocock, that you've had uh, on a regular basis discussions uh, with our minister uh, and that you have the opportunity to, uh, to, to raise these issues uh, and try and deal with these issues uh, <coughs> that uh, require, obviously, negotiation between the, the states uh, and the, uh, the, the territories. Um, unlike the previous government, uh, Senator Pocock, we are taking uh, the issue of homelessness uh, seriously, um, and we, we have started the process of delivering on all of the things that the previous government 
Thank you, Fail. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Th thank you, Minister. I, I appreciate your concern for the homeless, uh, but I'll take that as no new funding. Um, I understand that the government has written to state and territory governments offering to extend the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement by 12 months while the new housing, National Housing Plan is developed. Can the minister con please confirm if this offer included a 12-month extension of the payment for the equal remuneration order? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Pocock uh, for his uh, his question. <clears throat> well, I, I would have to say in response uh, to that question that um, I don't think it's fair to say uh, that uh, the government uh, has uh, no new funding in this uh, area. If I, th I can uh, explain some of the things, some of the things that um, uh, Minister th this Farrell, please sorry. resume your seat. Senator Pocock. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, sorry to call it. Uh, Point of order here. I'm just really interested if the 12-month extension for the equal remuneration order has been has been offered. Uh, yes, Senator Pocock. And in the uh, first part of your question, you also talked about no new funding, Minister Farrell. Th thank you, President. Thanks, uh, 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 Senator Pocock, for that uh, uh, clarification. Um, <coughs> there are ongoing negotiations, and I, I don't think at this stage it's fair to. Uh, draw any conclusions uh, about how those negotiations might uh, uh, might, uh, might 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 end up. Uh, un Senator unlike the Rusty. former government, uh, we are serious about addressing the issue of homelessness uh, in this uh, in this country. Um, we are engaged in a serious uh, set of, uh, of negotiations. Thank you, Minister. Your time and has I think expired. The... Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question oh, is. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, my apologies, Senator Pocock. Uh, second supplementary. Uh, thank, thank you, President. Um, I understand that the equal remuneration order hasn't been offered, which is $65 million worth of funding. And Homelessness Australia, whose CEO Kate Colvin is in the gallery, has said that without that money, some 650 frontline workers. Uh, will lose their jobs. Given one in three homeless people can't find accommodation, how do we justify that? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, um, <coughs> Senator Pocock for his questions. Um, look, I don't, I don't think I can be any um, clearer in response to that question and the, the, the earlier question. Um, this government is serious about addressing the issue uh, of homelessness in a way that the previous government wasn't even interested in talking about. Um, there are discussions. Um, Minister there, Farrell, there are, Minister there... Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin, your constant interjections are disrespectful and disorderly. I would ask you to remain silent for the remainder of his answer, Minister. Thank you, thank, <coughs> thank you, thank you, President. Thank you for that that protection uh, from this unruly rabble on the other side. Um, yes, that's right. That's right. Um, Senator Pocock, this, this, is a, this is a serious issue. This government is serious about addressing the issue uh, of homelessness. There are discussions uh, underway. I'm not going to uh, preempt those um, discussions at the moment, uh, but rest assured that this government is going to take action. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Farming families are frequently cash poor, but they make a living off farmland that's value has tripled over on paper in recent years, value that will remain unrealised potentially for decades for intergenerational farming operations. Will farmers that hold such land in self-managed super funds be forced to pay tens of thousands more in taxes under Labor's doubling of the super tax due to nothing more than paper fluctuations to commercial property prices? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. Uh, as uh, senators in this place would know, under prudential requirements, all superannuation funds are required to consider diversification and liquidity when making investments. And if funds are doing this, they should have some liquid assets to meet 
any tax liabilities. There are a range of cash flow there are a range of cash flow requirements within an SMSF, not just tax liabilities which trustees must consider. This includes, for example, accounting administration costs, investment fees and the costs associated with maintaining real assets such as property. For SMSFs with balances in the retirement phase, liquidity is also required for the purpose of meeting pension payments, including on those uh, minimum drawdown requirements. Individuals can also hold their assets in super and elect to pay the tax or any tax liabilities they have using savings outside of superannuation to avoid uh, paying from their business assets. So we have been clear what this change is about. It is for those with high balance accounts over $3 million. We know that there are accounts with hundreds of millions of dollars in them. Superannuation is primarily uh, about having a dignified retirement and being able to uh, have savings available to you during your retirement years. Um, what we are doing is making a very modest change to the concessional arrangements that remain concessional for those with balances over $3 million. Um, as to individual superannuation advice, I'm not in a position to give it, uh, but I have made um, clear Minister, what the— Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, I, I believe I have Senator McKenzie on her feet, Senator Scar. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. On relevancy, a uh, point of order. With the last 10 seconds left in the minister's ability to answer, the question was, will farm, due to the change made, will farmers now be subject to tens of thousands of dollars of additional tax thank you, uh, as a result McKenzie. of unrealised gains? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. is being relevant, Minister. Well, well, as I've said, and I'm not here to give individual tax advice to people to arrangements I have no knowledge of. Okay? I have set out the government's policy. I have, I have uh, already. Minister, your time has expired. Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Can the minister advise the number of registered primary producers that will be impacted through the government's proposed superannuation changes? Given her first answer, if not, why not? Thank you. Uh, Senator McKenzie, Minister Gallagher. There are around 80,000 account holders who will be impacted uh, by this very modest change. A num well, thank you, Senator Scar. You are, you are the most patronising of all senators in this place. Honestly, honestly, your interjections, they're pathetic. Order. They're pathetic. Order. I know. Order. You can't help yourself. Um, Minister, you can't help yourself. Minister Gallagher. You can't Minister help Gallagher, yourself. please resume yourself. Order. Order. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. Point of order on relevancy. How many primary producers uh, will be Senator impacted McKenzie, by the government's Senator McKenzie, policy? You do not need to repeat the question. The minister is being relevant. Um, please continue, Minister. Uh, thank you. And if there is further information I can provide, Senator McKenzie, I will, I will undertake to do so. But the change affects around 80,000 account holders. Now, a number of them uh, will be in SMSF arrangements, and I, another subset of them will have farm, farms as part of their assets. So I will undertake to come back to you, but the whole group that is affected is in the order of 80,000. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKenzie, second supplementary. Thank you. The National Farmers Federation has been critical about the complete lack of consultation from the Labor government on the superannuation changes. Why didn't the government consult before announcing changes that will uh, result on an unfair new tax on the family farm? Thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie, Minister. Thank you. Well, as, as we've made clear in the announcement last week, uh, that by announcing it ahead of the budget, but foreshadowing that it will be in the budget, allows for a period of further consultations. Now, that will be happening. Um, that tre Treasury will be undertaking a pu public consultation pr process on the implementation details, and we are open to uh, stakeholders' views, whether they be through the NFF or others, around um, any refinements or any unintended consequences of these changes. That is the purpose of the consultation period. But I would also say to those that are defending this, 
uh, or opposing this change. This is a very modest change to raise a very small amount of revenue. We have a $50 billion structural deficit in the budget left by you. That's every single year. This raises about $2 billion. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Um, just a moment. I'll just check that your mic's on. I'll call you again, Senator Lambie. Please start again. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Farrell. Minister, the cost of housing, uh, living pressures are hitting Tasmanians hard. The current average rent is 550 bucks a week, and it is getting worse. The cost of groceries, fuel, energy, and everyday living expenses are skyrocketing for Tasmanians. Life is basically getting harder. The waiting list for public housing sits at around 4,500, and that's on a good day. This list is growing and growing and growing. My question is in relation to the, ho the Housing Australian Future Fund. When will the detail of the investment mandate be finally released? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Madam uh, President, and thank uh, uh, Senator Lambie for her, uh, her question. Um, as I <coughs> indicated in my previous answer to uh, Senator uh, Pocock uh, on the issue of uh, housing and uh, homelessness, um, the government obviously recognises that um, uh, this is a significant uh, issue. Um, the former government, uh, in almost uh, 10 years, did, did nothing uh, in this uh, space, and so of course we have to make up for 10 years of, uh, of neglect. Yep. Um, we're doing that. Um, Senator um, Lambie, and uh, as we as we speak, there are discussions uh, underway in respect of the uh, the fund that you uh, you just uh, you just mentioned. Um, I'm sure if um, um, you you would like, I can organise for you to have some discussions with the uh, minister responsible in this area about these issues to get some some update on the. Uh, latest uh, latest state of play with with these issues, um, but look, can I can I give you this assurance, uh, Senator Lambie? Uh, this government is understands um, that there are problems here, understands that there's been years and years of neglect, understands that we've now got the obligation of um, dealing dealing with this issue, correcting correcting the problems of the, of the past. Uh, and making sure that uh, we deal with this issue uh, into the Minister, future. Please, Jimmy, Senator Lambie. Respect, uh, Madam President. I was just wondering whether I could have the detail of the investment mandate to, will be released. It's a simple detail. What date? What month? Simple. I just would have thought that was simple. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Lambie. There was also uh, quite a long introduction to that question. I do believe the minister is being relevant, but I'll continue to listen. And if he's not, I'll draw him to the to the question, Minister. Thank, thank you, President. I thought I had directly answered your question, uh, Senator Lambie, but I'll restate it. Um, uh, the investment uh, mandate is currently uh, being considered. Of course, the legislation hasn't yet passed the uh, pa yeah, passed the Parliament, and we. It. We, uh, we understand, of course, that the coalition is, uh, is opposing it. Thank you, Minister. It. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, order. Order. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, Australia currently has a school shortage across every sector. It is very hard to find tradies to do any work at the best of times on any home. We know a trade takes three to four years to complete and that TAFEs in Tasmania are still training with Cold War equipment. Can the minister explain how the government will achieve 30,000 homes with no qualified tradies and with Cold War equipment in our TAFEs? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, um, and thank uh, Senator Lambie for her, uh, her, her question. Um, I mean, it's not the housing industry that's the only area that uh, have labour shortages, as I'm sure you know. Um, Labor sh <coughs> labour shortages are a, a relic of uh, 
the inaction of the, uh, of the previous government, particularly in the pandemic area where you sent, you sent lots and lots of people home who might have been here, who might have been here, who might have been here, who might have been here to help build some of these, uh, some of these houses. Um, one, of, one of the significant, one of the significant um, policies that we took to at the last election, of course, uh, Senator Lambie, as you would know, uh, was the fee-free TAFE courses. Now, I appreciate that that doesn't come in overnight and it doesn't solve the problem uh, thank overnight. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Lambie, before I call you for your second supplementary, um, you do need to be in your designated seat. Thank you. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President, for that correction. Uh, my last uh, supplementary question is this. Minister, as my colleague Senator Tyrrell, Tyrrell has brought to your attention, Tasmania has an entitlement of 1,200 homes. So why is it that we have the housing minister who represents Tasmania and we're only getting 600 of that? Will the government today, right now, guarantee me that Tasmania will get what it is entitled to and get their 1,200 homes for Tasmania over the next five years? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and thank, uh, <coughs> thank uh, Senator Lambie for her uh, supplementary uh, question. Uh, look, I'd have <coughs> the greatest of faith in uh, Minister uh, Collins. Um, I was recently down in Tasmania. Uh, with her, um, with her, um, um, going to a range of uh, places, uh, and I'm sure that there's no better person in this government that understands the problems of uh, housing and housing shortages and all of the issues associated with it than uh, than uh, Senator Collins. And uh, I think I th I th I think you should. Uh, sorry, Minister Collins. No, she's, I've upgraded it to the Senate status. Uh, um, of course Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Lambie. Uh, with all due respect, um, Madam President, I just want to know whether we're going to get the 1,200 homes that we actually should be getting and not the 600, and whether that's going to be made right now. I don't want the waffle. Tasmanians just want to know we're going to get our Thank you, what Senator we do for 1,200, or you're going to uh, take Senator, half it off. Thank office. you, Senator Lambie. I'll draw the minister to your question. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, well, as I've said, um, I don't think there's any better person uh, in this uh, government to deal with the issues of uh, of housing uh, in, uh, in Tasmania than uh, Minister Collins. Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Minister, how will the government's $15 billion investment in the National Reconstruction Fund support a very important industry, the agriculture industry's ambition to exceed the $100 billion uh, farm gate output by 2030? Thank you, Senator Giacconi. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Giacconi, someone who I know has a very deep and long-standing interest in the agriculture industry in our country. Well, today, Senator Giacconi, I have good news for Australian farmers, farm workers and all in the agriculture supply chain. Today's latest release of data from ABES shows that the agriculture industry is well on its way towards its goal of exceeding $100 billion farm gate output by 2030. In the last financial year, the agriculture industry reached the $90 billion mark, an all-time record, and I congratulate every farmer, every processor, every worker and supply chain member for this achievement. Now, this was done off the back of what, with, what were, with some exceptions, great seasonal conditions, which have meant record farm cash incomes for broadacre and dairy farms over the past two years. But of course, the context to this is that input costs for farm businesses are rising, impacting farm profits. Years of failed energy policies and chronic underinvestment in skills development have come home to roost. As a result of this and global factors, agriculture input costs have risen sharply since mid-2021, particularly the price of fertiliser, which has more than doubled, putting intense strain on farming businesses to balance the books. And that's why the National Reconstruction Fund is so important. We need a future made in Australia, and that applies to agriculture just as much as every other industry. 
We should be value-adding and we should be making more things here. The ability to make things here is vital to not only reduce input costs, but also induce the, increase the value of the final product that our agriculture industry rolls out. And that's exactly what the National Reconstruction Fund will do. Co-investing with industry, including agriculture, to grow our primary industries and turn raw products into even higher value ones. The Albanese Labor government wants Australia to be a country that makes things again, and we are backing our agricultural manufacturing industry to ensure that that happens. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, Senator Ciccone, second, first supplementary. Thanks a lot, President, and I uh, thank the minister for that answer, particularly given the number of farmers in town today, given the ABES conference being held today and tomorrow. Minister, how is the government, the Labor government, prioritising the agriculture sector in the National Reconstruction Fund? Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Ciccone. Well, I'm very pleased to say that the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund, it even has the word national in it, a key election commitment from the Albanese government, has a $500 million portion sectioned out for investment in local manufacturing to support agriculture. Once established, that money will be available to co-invest in more food processing, in bringing down energy costs and more value-adding. It's and a great example of something that could potentially fit in that category uh, is that we should that we should be making here is fertilizer. We have the raw materials here in Australia that we export to other countries. So why shouldn't we be making more fertilizer here in Australia? And why shouldn't the government support industry to get it started? And that's exactly what our National Reconstruction Fund would be available to do. Co-invest with industry to boost value adding. I've been speaking about this with farmers and industry in recent weeks, grain growers, meat processors and many more. It's vital the NRF passes the House and the Senate and we encourage everyone to get behind Thank it. Thank you, Minister White. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. And thank you for mentioning uh, communities, particularly those right around uh, regional Australia, Minister. So how will the National Reconstruction Fund support those very communities that rely on the ag sector across regional Australia? Minister Watt. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Coney. More jobs, more exports, more opportunities and a better bottom line for regional Australia. Who wouldn't want that? Well, unfortunately, quite a few of those members opposite, it seems, are anti-manufacturing and anti-jobs. Whether it's Mr Dutton or Mr Littleproud or the Liberals and the Nationals here in the Senate, the Coalition only want to say no to this fund. More manufacturing in our regions? No. More value-adding in agriculture? No. More tax concessions for the top 0.5 per cent? Oh, yes. Now, uh, there, I am surprised that the Nationals in particular are opposing the National Reconstruction Fund. Not only does it contain the word national, but in the past they have claimed to support Aussie manufacturing. And instead, in fact, it wasn't that long ago that Senator Canavan was saying, quote, we've all seen during the coronavirus how important it is to have industries that can produce things in the medical field to keep our food production and food security going. And after coronavirus, we're going to need to have a strong manufacturing industry to recover. You, Senator well, Senator Watt, Canavan, have I got a solution expired. for you? Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Prior to the election last year, the now Treasurer said, this is a full-blown cost of living crisis, a triple whammy of skyrocketing costs of living, falling real wages and rising interest rates. And said, yet since the election, inflation has skyrocketed to its highest levels in 30 years, wages aren't keeping up, energy prices continue to rise and rise, and just now, as we all know, the Reserve Bank has announced their ninth rise under this government. Minister, is it correct that under Labor's full-blown cost of living crisis, an average family with a $750,000 loan taken out prior to May will now be paying $1,470 more per month? or $17,688 a year extra on their mortgage. Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Cash for the question. Um, and uh, sh the senator is correct that the Reserve Bank at 2.30 today increased uh, interest rates by 25 basis points to 3.6%. It's the 10th um, in interest rate increase uh, since they began in May 2022, uh, prior to the election, when we entered the tightening cycle because of what was happening uh, with the inflation challenge. So I, I 
do not accept um, the pro proposition put by Senator Cash that this is something that has occurred since the election. It was started before the election. Uh, it started before the started before the, the issues that have policy. led to the tightening cycle, Order. which have Order. been impacted Order. by some of those global factors, which I think we all accept, started before the last election. On the cost of living, this is the real issue facing households, and it's good that we've come to it because the cost of living pressures are real on households, and that's why the government has been making some difficult decisions around the cabinet table because of the difficult decisions people are making around their kitchen table. That is why we have energy power bill relief Order. coming in the budget Order. to deal with it that you oppose. So don't sit here. Don't you dare sit here uh, Minister, and cry Minister, crocodile tears about seat. a cost of living please crisis. Order. Order. Minister, please continue. Well, tears about a co uh, your concern for a cost of living crisis when you opposed and have opposed the sensible measures we put in place to assist households with some of those increased in power bills. Remember that. Remember that. We Senator won't let Cash. you forget it. As those as those bills come in, we will be reminding people that you voted against any support for cost of living relief in households across Australia. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Won't Labor's $45 billion in extra spending make inflation worse while your productivity sapping industrial relations sabotage agenda will make business weaker? Why are your government's policies making a difficult situation worse? Minister. Ash clearly hasn't read the budget papers. So a couple of things there. A couple of things there. The funds have been factored into the budget and the forward estimates. Okay? And the inflation and the inflation forecasts are also there. Are also there. So no, the answer to that is no. On no surprises here. And and Senator Cash, yeah, no surprises here. Why, why are you putting in place laws that make sure that uh, vulnerable Order. workers can get decent pay rises? Order. That is now the offence of this government, that we're putting in place laws that support uh, affordable, sustainable wage increases for the most vulnerable of workers. We know you're opposed to it. We've just lived through 10 years of your deliberate design feature of your economic architecture being wage stagnation. The investments in the funds are about driving jobs, investment in supply chain and dealing with the housing crisis. And you're opposed to every single one of those Thank you, measures. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Given Australians can expect further rate rises in the months ahead, why hasn't the government delivered the cost of living relief it promised last year for Australians to help with their energy bills? Why is the Albanese government Order. all talk but no fix when it comes to addressing the cost of living pressures Order. that Australians Order. are facing? Order. Uh, order on my right. Order. Senator Cash. I'm not calling the minister until there's silence in the chamber. Senator Watt. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I fear that someone who didn't like you wrote that question, uh, Senator Cash. How could you possibly ask us? How could you possibly put to us when you opposed? The billions of dollars that we want to flow through the budget to give Order. households energy bill relief. It is staggering that, that those who opposed it in December, and we will make sure that all the way to the next election, everyone knows that when we came to the parliament Order. and said, Order. here's one and a half billion dollars we would like to distribute to households and businesses across Australia to assist with some of the increases in energy prices, the no alition said no. You know what? No, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve this cost of living relief. And then the how the high to come in here and ask about what we're doing about cost of living relief on energy bills. Well, thank you very much for that, thank Doris. You, Minister. Senator. Your time has expired, Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you.
Senator McGrath. Uh, Ministers, to all questions asked by coalition senators. You have the call. What, what today, what we saw in question time today, Mr. Deputy President, is a Labor Party who have fundamentally failed to understand that they've broken the trust with the Australian people. Because once you break one promise, and we've seen that, we know they're going to break more promises. So if they're going to go after people with $3 million in their super accounts, what's to stop them going after people with $250,000 in their super account? So that is what this is all about. It is about the fundamental breach of a, between a political party who are elected into office those, and those who voted for them. And what we've seen, what we've seen about super is the Labor Party are forgetting the main principle of super that it's not the Labor Party's money, it's not the government's money, it's not Canberra's money. It is your money. It's money that you've put away. It's money that your employer has put away on your behalf so, so you can have a safe retirement. But what we're seeing with the Labor Party um, over the last few weeks is a Labor Party who went to the last election, promised one thing, and now have swooped in like a bunch of ang angry magpies yeah. wanting to steal people's money from them, because that's what this debate is about. It is about the Labor Party taking your money from you. The Prime Minister, the now Prime Minister before the election, specifically ruled out any changes to the super system. That's what the Prime Minister said. Jim Chalmers, sorry, um, Treasurer Chalmers, said the same thing. There are not going to be any changes to taxes. There will be no tax rises. But what has happened is that they are doubling the taxes on people's super accounts. Now, Treasurer Chalmers is, is someone who has a what you'd call a, a, an eccentric um, economic legacy that he's inherited because he is a child of Paul Keating. Treasurer Chalmers did his PhD on Paul Keating. Paul Keating, who most famously broke a promise before an election when he said that those tax cuts would be LAW, law tax cuts. Keating broke that promise. Then, then, Treasurer Chalmers, Mr Deputy President, went on to great heights and, and worked for that other great Labor Treasurer, that other Labor great Treasurer, Wayne Swan, and he was his Deputy Chief of Staff and then Chief of Staff. So this, this is the person who is in charge of Australia's finances. Someone who is the that Jim Chalmers is the sorry Treasurer Chalmers is the love child of Paul Keating and Wayne Swan. And if that doesn't scare you, then the full realization that Labor are coming after your super accounts should should scare you, because a Labor minister has said in relation to your super accounts, is that it's honey. It's honey. Now, just think about that. Now, I'm a big fan, big fan of Winnie the Pooh, and Winnie the Pooh is a great fan of honey. But that's Winnie the Pooh's honey. How dare the Labor Party treat your money, money that you have worked so hard for, as their money, but also their honey, to be given away, to be put where they want it. Leave people's money alone. Look, I don't know anyone who's got millions of dollars in their super account. But guess what? Good on them. They worked so hard for it. It's not like they won gold lotto. They got a roll over and went, yippee, I've got $3 million in my bank account. These people worked for it. And what the Labor government is saying to these Australians is, we're taking that money off you. But, the, but what should concern you even more? And I'll repeat myself here because certain people in this building are hard of hearing and probably come from the shallow end of the gene pool and don't understand basic economics, is that if they're going to come for super accounts with $3 million in it, they're going to come for super accounts with $250,000 in it or $300,000 in it. Because once you break a promise, you'll break other promises. So this is the strongest message that has come out of today's question time. Is it Labor? Have no shame. No shame whatsoever about breaking promises, but also have no shame about taking your money. 
money that you and your family work so hard for. But the mob over there, the mob on the left side of politics, don't understand that because they've never had a real job. These are the people who have never worked on a farm, have never worked in a business. These people have worked in the public service. Good on people who, by the way, work in the public service, except when you end up on that side, being that bunch of economic vandals who are destroying Australians' retirements. Thank you, Mr. Mc <coughs> Senator McGrath. Senator Stewart. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I just want to start by thanking Senator David Pocock uh, for advocating for people who actually need government support, and that is people who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Unlike, sorry, uh, Senator Scar. Irrelevance. Uh, well, I, I think the uh, I think the honourable senator hasn't had long enough to ma make make it. Senator, Senator Stewart, I'm handling the I'm handling it. I don't require assistance from you on handling a point of order. So uh, just let me finish it, and then I'll give you the call in a moment. Senator Scar, the, the, the senator hasn't had long enough to even attempt to be irrelevant. Senator Stewart. <laughs> Thank you. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Thanking Senator Pocock for advocating for people who really need uh, uh, help from the government. Unlike the hill that those opposite are going to die on for 0.5 per cent of the population, who have over $3 million in their super balances. An absolute, an absolute disgrace. This is the hill they want to die on. But sure, sure, some sensible questions coming from over here, but here is just absolutely ludicrous. We know what side they've chosen, and it is not the side of the Australian people. It is not the side of the Australian people. But we know that the tax changes that they made to superannuation affects one in three people. Four per cent of the population, one in three people. It will affect in 30 years' time, but sure, have a crack at us. They don't want to support things that will actually ease the cost of living pressures for Australians, like cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine, skills, housing. 0.5 per cent of the population is who they're focused on. Things that, you know, the, th the people they're advocating wouldn't necessarily care a whole lot about these things. They don't care about secure jobs. They don't care about Australian manufacturing. They don't call about, to care about affordable housing, power bill relief, or, or wage increases for you know, the, the, our lowest paid workers across our economy. Veterans at risk of homelessness, women fleeing family violence, businesses looking for energy security. They don't care about any of these things, but they're advocating so, so hard for 0.5 per cent of the population. It wasn't just Labor who inherited a trillion dollars of debt from the absolute derelict management of the budget. It's the Australian people who inherited that debt. Australian taxpayers are having to pay for the trillion dollars of debt that they left them. So I just want to make sure that we understand the problem that we are, we are facing as a country and that Australian taxpayers are having to pay the bill for. An absolute neglect of responsibility on their side. On their side. So what's been really clear over the last couple of weeks is whose side they are really on. They are on the side of 17 people who have over $100 million in their super. That's whose side they are on, not on, the, not on the side of the average Australian person. They are on the side of the one person who has $400 million in their super. But they want to absolutely try to deny a dollar an hour wage increase for our lowest paid workers. One dollar an hour is all they were asking for. They want to absolutely say that's off the table, but they want to go in hard and die on a hill for people who have over three million dollars in their super balances. What an absolute disgrace. What an absolute disgrace. They want to be on, on the side of 0.5 per cent of the population. It's worth saying that Labor built super. We will always protect it. We know that they 
have a whole lot of things that they want to say no to. Secure jobs, Australian manufacturing, affordable housing, power bill relief, wage increases. But what they want to say yes to is borrowing billions of dollars, billions of dollars to give 0.5 per cent of Australians a tax break. 0.5 billions of dollars. This will give the budget $2 billion in its first year. They have no solutions, no ideas, no alternatives, just no. Their idea for trying to repair some of the budget damage that was done is to go after some of our most vulnerable Australians. Shame. And of course, I'm talking about robo debt. And let me say from Alan Tudge, he said, we'll find you, we'll track you down and you will have to repay those debts and you may end up in prison. Shame. Track, trying to track down some of the most vulnerable Australians, but advocate hard for those who have $3 million in their superannuation. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Bragg. Thanks, President. And I rise to make some remarks uh, in relation to Senator Gallagher's answers. Now, uh, the, government, the now government made a number of promises before the election about not wanting to touch uh, super. Several statements were made on the record. Then, of course, uh, further to that, there were statements made about not wanting to touch franking credits. Uh, this week, we've seen legislation introduced to change franking credits uh, to destroy the franking system and, of course, a new policy to introduce a new tax on super. Now, all of these ideas may have been held in the Treasury Department. The government is facilitating these ideas because uh, they are not wanting to restrain spending, which is what they should be doing. They're spending $45 billion on off-balance sheet items, which of course are fueling inflation, and we've seen another interest rate rise today thanks to the Labor Party. Now, of course, the government could also be looking to bank their gains from uh, their commodity price increases, uh, but rather than do that, they've decided to introduce this new tax. And so far, the government have had two policies on tax uh, in relation to super, or sorry, two policies on super. The first policy has been to funnel more money to the unions, and the second policy has been to put in place a new tax. So um, if they're not uh, locking it up and taxing it, they're locking it up and shipping it off to the union. Those are the two, two policies the Labor government has on super. Now, in relation to this particular taxation measure, uh, it does introduce a very novel, very strange concept of unrealised gain. So uh, if you're a company, uh, you don't pay tax on revenue, uh, you don't pay tax on sales, you pay tax on profit. Uh, now you deduct your expenses from your revenue and that is your profit and you pay tax on that profit. And the same thing goes for the super funds today. Uh, they pay tax on earnings because, of course, this recognises that it's very hard to pay a tax if you haven't actually got some money in your hand to pay the tax man. But the government uh, want to pursue this very strange idea of unrealised gains, uh, which of course uh, will result in superannuants having to sell lumpy assets uh, in their funds in order to pay the tax man. Now, that is a foreign concept in Australian taxation law, so it remains to be seen how that will happen. Perhaps the most important point, though, is the judgment call not to index this idea. Now, for the party that says that super is their favourite thing, uh, this, is a, this is the thing that is going to wreck the system. Because why would anyone want to put money into a system for 30 or 40 years now knowing there's going to be a great big tax at the end of it? Now, now if you are 30 years old, you are going to be the cohort that is going to have the greatest tax disincentive because of the time value of money. So because it's not indexed, why, why on earth would people put money into this scheme? So um, if I wanted to wreck the system, uh, and I personally think it's a very bad system because it doesn't work very well for workers or for the taxpayer, uh, I, I would do what the Labor government is doing, which is to not, not index the scheme. Increasingly, Australians will look at other ways of saving for retirement. Now, one of the great differences in this chamber is we believe in the individual. We believe that Australians are smart enough to make their own judgments. The Labor Party believe in paternalism and they think people are too stupid to save for themselves. So, so therefore they have introduced 
I can't, I can't hear over the interjections, right. Deputy President. You might need to come and bail me out. Now, of course, the, the Labor government believe in paternalism, and so they think people are too stupid to save for themselves. So they've introduced this savings scheme, which takes away. I can't hear over the interjections. Sorry. Yeah, order on my right. I, I can't hear the. Thank you. I can't hear myself think here. So they've introduced, they've introduced this system. It's very paternalistic, and now I think they're going to kill it with this this design feature. Of course. Uh, this policy, though, this new tax policy, works in tandem with the, uh, another Mr Stephen Jones initiative to introduce an objective for super, which of course the government want to introduce to stop people from taking money out when there's an emergency, like a pandemic, or to take money out to pay for a first home deposit. Because of course their only objective here is to keep the money in the fund so that they can be transferred over to the union. Because of course in the government for vested interests, the only objective is to feather the nests of the rent seekers and the blood suckers at the unions and the super funds. They don't give a rat's about the workers. Senator Ullman Payne. Sorry, Senator, sorry, Payne. Senator Payne. It's my okay. Apologies. It's very similar. No, I've no, got no, it mixed no, up my before. Um, Senator Bragg, I can't believe you just said that it's wrecking the system. Um, Senator Hume earlier mentioned something about how. Um, this is another tax credit to prop up rampant spending. So can we just get the facts straight here? Those opposite thinking increasing wages of our lowest paid workers is rampant spending? Are you saying that increasing paid parental leave is rampant spending? Are you saying that cheaper medicine to help all those vulnerable Australians is rampant spending? Are you saying that accessible and affordable housing is rampant spending? And now you walk away. Now listen to this. Senator, Are Senator you Payne, serious? Senator, Senator, Senator Payman, I've got the point of order. You cannot reflect on the movement of an individual of a senator in it. I withdraw. Have no, a great day, no Senator Bragg. Getting back to the context of the matter, I'm having yeah, too much you. fun, clearly. Um, we will not allow those opposite to lecture us on honesty and transparency. This is a modest and meaningful change that has come before the government and the government who was elected by the Australians as a responsible government to fix up the mess that we were left with. A trillion dollars in debt. And not only that, there was a decade of delay, denial, destruction. That's triple Ds on your report card, but debts in the trillions as well. I don't think your parents would be happy. Now stop blaming COVID for your poor policy choices. You had a decade. What did you do? And it's it's exactly thank you, Senator Stewart. Those opposite love spreading fear. They don't realise that this, this change is going to not affect 99.5 per cent of Australians out there. 99.5 per cent. These are Australians who are doing it tough out there with the cost of living, the rising pressures that are on their families. And Senator Henderson, okay. Senator Henderson <laughs> well, in please don't. Yeah, no, Senator they, Wong, they don't. When it comes to them... Senator Payman is... Hand... It's not a discussion. I'm very interested okay. in what Senator Payman is, is you. debating in the chamber. Can Thank we just allow you, her President. to speak in silence? Thank you. So, going back, it's, it's fewer than 0.5 per cent of Australians with super balances of $3 million. They will, they will enjoy generous tax concessions, not as generous as they have been. And I don't think that's asking for a lot. When we're talking about what the government has delivered so far for uh, people who are doing it tough out there, including making medicines cheaper, creating 180,000 fee-free TAFE places, delivering on the 20,000 new university places, establishing 10 days of paid uh, family and domestic violence leave, making sure that we had a jobs and skills summit to hear from stakeholders, to hear from locals about what were the issues in, in those industries that we um, needed to address. We've established a national anti-corruption commission. We've got wages moving again after a decade of stagnation that we've um, experienced. And, and we hear from those opposite of all this being rampant spending. Rampant spending to 
take some sense of responsibility and to actually fix the mess, uh, it, it's really tough to just sit there and, and hear all that. As um, Senator Stewart mentioned earlier and quoted um, one of your one of one of uh, your leaders. <laughs> I don't know if it's appropriate for me to mention their names, but last week we heard that a member for the member for Fadden admit to the Royal Commission that he lied about robo debt because loyalty to his colleagues mattered more, not what it did to Australian people. So many Australians suffered under this scheme. For what? Now, what a perfect summary of this entire time in government, loyalty to themselves and not to the Australian people. And you sit here thinking that Australians should listen to you, to your scare campaign, to you neglecting them, putting yourself first. It's, it, it really is a matter of not just shame, but for you to really reflect. I, I would highly advise that those opposite should really reflect on the last decade that you've been in government and what you've done with that time. Um, and maybe take a leaf from our book of what we've achieved in the short time we've been in power. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And I'd say, Senator Payman, I've got my own library. I don't need to take a leaf out of anyone else's books, but I did enjoy seeing her having fun in terms of making her contribution here today. And I acknowledge uh, her contribution. Uh, there are two fundamental issues we, we have in relation to this issue of the superannuation changes. There are two fundamental issues. The first is the legitimate expectation of a, the Australian people for people who are elected to this place, especially, especially if they're from the governing parties, to say before an election what they plan to do and to actually then do it, and also to say before an election what they're not going to do and don't do it. And that's the issue we have. That's the first issue. That is the first issue. And let's go through it chronologically. This is all on the public record. Our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Albanese, said on 31 January 2022, we have not planned for any changes on superannuation. End quote. We have not planned for any changes on superannuation. Barely one year later, promise broken. Our Treasurer. The Honourable Jim Chalmers, member for Rankin, quote, look, we've said about superannuation that we would maintain the system. We would maintain the system, end quote. And our Treasurer said that on ABC Insiders, 27 March 2022, less than 12 months ago. Promise broken. And then our Prime Minister again, quote, we've said we have no intention to make any super changes. That's our Prime Minister, now Prime Minister, 2 May 2022. Promise broken. And that is the fundamental issue in terms of this debate. Broken promises from the now Labor government. They said in opposition that they wouldn't do certain things. They get in the government less than 12 months later. Less than 12 months later, they do exactly the opposite, exactly the opposite of what they promised not to do. And that and that will quite legitimately shake the Australian people's belief in the integrity of this new government. They have said one thing before an election to get elected and then do the opposite thing after an election. And to be frank, it impacts all of us. It impacts all politicians because we all suffer a bit when someone makes a promise before an election and doesn't carry it through. And that's the problem. That's the fundamental problem we have here. The government saying one thing in opposition and doing the opposite when they get elected. The second issue we have here is the notion that you should tax unrealised capital gains. I don't know where this concept came from. I don't know where this concept came from, but it doesn't make any sense. In terms of superannuation, you want to keep your investments stable over the longer term. You shouldn't be forced to sell them in order to meet a tax liability. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know where the government got this advice from. And in terms of my colleague Senator McKenzie asked a very, very legitimate question of the finance minister with respect to the position of farming families who hold the family farm in a self-managed super fund. Now, quite reasonable 
that taxes paid in terms of the rent that's paid by the individuals to the self-managed super fund which owns the farm. Quite reasonable. No one's going to quibble with that. Quite, quite reasonable. Wouldn't cavil with that at all. But the problem is, under the laws as proposed, if the price of the farm fluctuates upwards because high rainfall, the markets are good, etc., etc., it can create a tax liability which requires the liquidation of the farm in order to meet the tax liability. That is the fundamental issue. And it isn't just me saying this, it is the National Farmers Federation. This is what they said, not my words, not the words of a politician, but the words of the peak body representing farmers. This is what they said. Australia's peak farming body has warned that superannuation changes announced by Tre Treasurer Jim Chalmers could cool investment in agriculture unless the detail is worked through with farmers. Quote, yesterday's announcement throws up significant uncertainty for family farms with scant detail on things like grandfathering, treatment of revaluations or how this might impact lending in a climate of rising costs and interest rates." End quote. Not my words, not the words of a politician, but the peak body representing farmers. And the farmers of my home state of Queensland deserve to get answers in relation to those questions from the finance minister. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator McGrath. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the response to my uh, question from the minister representing the Treasurer. Well, as I stand here to make this speech, the RBA has just raised interest rates again. This is the first time in Australia's history that there has been 10 consecutive interest rate rises. Now, the RBA itself has found that the current inflation spike is being primarily driven by supply side shocks and corporate profiteering. The RBA itself has admitted that its models are not well suited for supply shocks and also that there is very little that monetary policy can do to offset supply shocks. The RBA said today that the monthly CPI indicator suggests that inflation has peaked. Yet here we find ourselves, colleagues, 10 consecutive interest rate rises. The RBA is responding to a problem it admits its models can't understand with a solution that it admits is the wrong tool for the job. This is a form of institutional madness. The central bank is out of control and it needs to be reined in. And this is where the government should act. Specifically, Treasurer Jim Chalmers needs to wake up from his slumber and take action to save the renters and mortgage holders of Australia by being smashed by the RBA's relentless and dogmatic interest rate rises. Now, the Treasurer has the power under the RBA Act currently, and he should exercise that power rather than sitting idly by while the RBA risks tanking the economy and smashing renters and mortgage holders. So instead of sitting on his hands, he should intervene on the RBA. But what else he should do is introduce a corporate super profits tax. Now let's all be clear about where we find ourselves at the moment. Real wages are declining at the fastest rate on record in Australia. Yet corporate profits are going through the roof. Oh, we are through the looking glass here, colleagues. This is the dead end of neoliberal economics, where people are starving while the corporations announce mega profits and the government does nothing about it because they are blinkered by their neoliberal orthodoxy and the opposition the same. Now, this is where 
we find ourselves. The Treasury told Senate Estimates Committee that the risk of a wage price spiral remains low. But here we are, renters and mortgage holders getting smashed by interest rate rises in a circumstance where the RBA itself has found that the majority of the inflation spike is being driven by supply side shocks and corporate profiteering. And the government seems to believe that 10 consecutive interest rate rises, smashing people, renters and mortgage holders into poverty, is the right response to a non-existent wage price spiral. Figures out today have showed that the volume in retail sales is in decline. People are buying less because they can't afford to buy stuff. The poorest Australians, those who can least afford to be made worse off, are being left behind while the wealthiest Australians continue to make off like bandits. And yet all the government can do is offer some ashen-faced commentary while people are being smashed into poverty, while the banks, the fossil fuel corporations and the supermarkets announce mega profits. We need to tax corporate super profits, tax the wealthy, freeze rents, put dental and mental health into Medicare and raise income support. So we could all do it all tomorrow if the government would work with the Greens. I put the question as moved by Senator McKim. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.